Good afternoon, all. Uh, John Davis, uh, UK director at at Sands. I am joined by Ken, based in Michigan. I think it's 10 a.m. your end, Ken, at, at the yeah. moment. Ken is a certified Sands instructor for Sec 488 Cloud Security Essentials and Sec 510 Public Cloud Security. Now, obviously, in this new world. Um, the instructors themselves aren't flying continent to continent so we've got the ability to run a lot more personalized and community-based events and and this being one um i'm really looking forward to this we are pretty much on a hard stop at four so i'm going to stop talking <laughs> and i'm going to hand over to ken ken floor's yours okay well thank you john i am delighted to be here and as John gave me that introduction, I've enjoyed meeting the various people that I've talked to from the large customers that SANS does business with. And it was really interesting for me to hear some of your challenges, problems, and opportunities. So what I've done is I've crafted together this talk that is based on some of my experiences as a security engineer. Now, before I got into the job role of security engineer, I'd spent a decade working for Kraft Foods as an electrical engineer, and then another decade working as a startup founder of a health IT company. So what I'm going to talk about is some of the epic hacks that happened earlier in, the, in my career that have really shaped my philosophy as a security professional. So I wanna talk about some of these epic hacks and lessons that we can learn from them. I also wanna talk about mental models and these mental models help us cope with the complexity in the world around us. However, if we rely too much on these mental models, that can be our downfall. And I also wanna talk in general about how hackers view the world differently and also I want to make a strong case as to why you should embrace your inner hacker and then lastly talk about how to do just that. Back in 2012, I was working as a security engineer for a company called ShopBop.com. ShopBop.com sells women's designer fashions around the world. And back then, ShopBop had recently been acquired by Amazon and we're in the process of integrating with Amazon as one of their subsidiaries. And part of my job, of course, was vulnerability management. And that year there were numerous Java vulnerabilities that were all discovered by a guy named Adam Gaudiak and his company, Security Explorations. And as I'm dealing with vulnerability after vulnerability, there must have been over 60 of them that I had to deal with that year. I started to think, what is it that he is seeing in the code that other security researchers, and especially the folks that are creating this code, are not finding and are not seeing? And I began to realize that hackers think about the problem differently. That year, there was also a massive breach of LinkedIn. We later found out that the total was somewhere in the neighborhood of 170 million email password combinations. And it was clear that they weren't following the best practices of salting their hashed passwords. And I had always wondered what exactly happened there. And interestingly, there was a Darknet Diaries episode just this past March, episode 86, called The LinkedIn Incident. And during this episode, they went into great detail of how it was that LinkedIn actually got breached. But what fascinated me at the time was Amazon's passwords in the wild process. Essentially, what would happen is if Amazon found an email password combination, they would test it against Amazon systems to see if the account holder had an email password that was found in the wild. And if so, they would deactivate that account so that way the password cannot be used to defraud Amazon. And the reason why that this stuck in my mind was that at the time shopop.com did not have that automation in place and we had to perform it in a more manual process. 
But it occurred to me that whoever came up with this idea originally was thinking like a hacker. After all, if an attacker can find passwords in the wild and try them against our systems, well then why can't we do that as well? Back in 1917, there was an art exhibit that revolutionized the way we think about art. An artist, a guy by the name of Marcel Duchamp, submitted a urinal and he called his art exhibit The Fountain. But this was so controversial that he got kicked off this society that prided themselves in independent thought and experimental artwork. They actually thought he was pulling a practical joke on them, and this forever changes the way that we think about art. Many people believe that art is intentionally supposed to be provoking. It's supposed to stop us in our tracks and puzzle us or generate conversation. In this regard, Marcel Duchamp truly was an artist, and I think that's what hackers are. They look at something differently and they figure out how to provoke the public and generate discussion. And of course, the second person to try the stunt is not an artist, but a copycat. Hackers also think multiple chess moves ahead. Matt Honan is a writer for Wired Magazine. And Honan had his identity stolen in 2012, and his digital world came crashing down. The reason he was targeted because, was because the attacker liked his three-letter Twitter handle, M-A-T. And the hacker did his recon and found out that his Twitter profile linked to Honan's website, which also included Honan's Gmail address. So guessing that Honan's Gmail address was the recovery email for his Twitter account, the attacker went to Google's account recovery page and after entering in the uh, Gmail address was provided with Honan's masked recovery email as m dot 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 n at me.com. Now me.com is currently deprecated, but it belongs to Apple, and this was an email system that was used by iPod or in, in Apple users prior to iCloud. So the attacker made a call to Amazon and provided Honan's name and billing address and had the customer service rep on the phone add a new credit card to Honan's account. The attacker calls back so as to get another customer service agent impersonating Honan again and is able to change the email on Honan's Amazon account using Honan's billing address and the previously provided credit card account by authenticating to Amazon. So then, after gaining control of the Amazon account, the attacker logs into it and then is able to use the password resent link sent to the new email and then notes on all the, the credit card tails that are used by Honan to buy merchandise on Amazon. Next, the attacker calls AppleCare and states that he can't log into his me.com email. And then he uses the appropriate credit card tail which was obtained from Amazon and Honan's billing address again to authenticate to Apple ID. AppleCare issued a temporary password and sent that attacker an email to reset Honan's Apple ID link or Apple ID account. And then since me.com was the recovery email for Gmail, the attacker could reset Honan's Gmail password since no multi-factor authentication was being used at the time. The next, the Twitter password reset link was sent to Gmail, and then he now had control of the Twitter account. While he was in iCloud, he destroyed all of his family photos and other documents that Honan had uploaded. And he also used iCloud to wipe his iPhone and Mac, and then he caused Honan a bunch of reputational damage by sending hateful tweets. So this impacted Twitter, Google, Apple, and Amazon. And they all, of course, had to address those issues. Back at 2012, at Black Hat 2019, there was a guy named Artem Dynaberg that did a very interesting talk. He demonstrated how to exploit bit errors that result in DNS queries for incorrect domain names. 
So here's how it worked. So take as an example a domain name like CNN.com, and if you flip just a single bit, you can get something like con.com. So that's one bit difference from CNN.com. And he's like, hmm, if this happens, I wonder what would occur if I registered a bunch of domain names. So what he did was he took some original domain names like Amazon, Microsoft.com, and Facebook's content delivery network, FB cdn.net and then he generated some domain names that were just one bit apart and registered all those next he set up a simple application to listen for incoming http requests and log the data now this could have been a malicious website had artem been so inclined but he was more interested in simply collecting the data and what is interesting is he did receive a large number of website hits when he was doing this experiment, especially over here on the content delivery network like names. Now, most people see the world in ones and zeros, but not Artem Dynaberg. He knows how digital cir circuits actually work. They quantize digital signal levels, rounding them up to a one or down to a zero. And he understood that bit errors are the result of a variety of different root causes, such as heat, power fluctuations, aging hardware, and even solar activity, such as sunspots and solar flares. Artem Dynaberg sees the world differently. Artem Dynaberg is a hacker. What was it that informed his paradigm? Well, first of all, his knowledge of hardware failures, his research, and his collaboration with others in the security community. A couple of years later, the Heartbleed vulnerability rocked the internet. Forbes called it the worst vulnerability since commercial traffic began to flow on the internet. This vulnerability was the result of improper validation in a TLS extension that was introduced in the OpenSSL cryptography library. And this flaw resulted in over 500 vulnerable servers that leaked their memory to any client that knew how to ask for it. This vulnerability was simultaneously discovered by Google Project Zero and Codenomica. But how did they find it? Especially since the evidence of exploitation would not be captured in most locks, except for something like full packet capture. And since this flaw was in the OpenSSL library, it is also a supply chain vulnerability because so many different systems depend on it. Technically, Heartbleed is considered to be a buffer overread bug. Most people know what a buffer overflow vulnerability is, and that's when we jam arbitrary code into a buffer in an attempt to get the CPU to execute it. And that vulnerability is the result of improper bounds checking. A buffer overread vulnerability is just the converse. This is where a process reads more data from memory than was intended. So how did this happen with Heartbleed? Well, the malicious client simply lied about the size of its heartbeat payload. And the open SSL library trusted it. Hackers lie to their software just to see what will happen. Shellshock was another vulnerability that sent shockwaves just about nine months after Heartbleed. Shellshock is a remote command execution vulnerability in the born again shell. In Bash, a user can read a set of variables, for example, user, or they can declare a variable like greeting. And I can also declare a function such as welcome and then invoke that function. Now in the vulnerable version of Bash, one could export that function and it would be available to other running processes that could also access environment variables. This particular vulnerability though was the result of Bash incorrectly executing any commands that got tacked onto the exported function. And what increased the severity of this vulnerability was the fact that so many processes depend on Bash. 
many web server CGI scripts set bash variables for the web server to use, all without sanitizing the input. And the result is remote code execution. And the problem wasn't just limited to web servers either. Some hackers targeted the user agent string. And this example shows some joker making the CD drive open using the bin eject command. Cloudflare had a great blog post where they gave several examples of what they were seeing in the wild. Things like recon and a denial of service attack, and this one's a denial of service attack, and then even a full system takeover. So hacking is going in deep and fiddling with the code, asking, how can I break this? How can I use this unexpected, undocumented behavior and come up with an exploit. Now, by the way, the examples that Cloudflare shown, these were oftentimes just script kitties. They weren't that artist that came up with a new idea. Google Project Zero, Codenomicon, however they discovered this and anybody that had been exploiting this zero day before it was known, those were the true artist hackers. I often think about this Buckminster Fuller quote when I'm doing a security review. And if the code is contorted, I suspect it is vulnerable. In all my years of engineering, I've learned that the most complicated ideas occur to us first, and it takes a lot of effort to get something as simple and elegant as Buckminster Fuller's Buckyball as an example. And it's hard to call your baby ugly but it's so critical to have someone with that hacker mindset poke at it. CryptoLocker. CryptoLocker was the first rampant malware to aggressively use strong encryption prior to demanding a payment in exchange for a decryption key. Before CryptoLocker, previous generations of ransomware such as Reviton and Uraski, Tobfi and Kovter would simply lock the system but could be removed by security tools. The very first encryptor, however, GP code, dated back way back to 2004, but it was targeting mostly Russian banks and similar businesses, and it only had a 660-bit RSA key. CryptoLocker targeted the most popular file extensions created by users, but it left the operating system files alone and it encrypted each file with its own data encryption key, and then that data encryption key was encrypted with the malware's public key. And the wrapped data encryption key was stored along with the encrypted file and other metadata. CryptoLocker demanded a ransom, and it was somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 US dollars, and could be paid in Bitcoin and a variety of other payment methods. But what was remarkable about CryptoLocker being one of the first rampant ransomwares was that it had a reputation that if you paid the ransom, it would decrypt the files. CryptoLocker was improved over time, adding support for PDFs and removable drives in later iterations. And it's pretty clear that the creators of the malware were monitoring the internet forums that were discussing the malware. Later that year, they came out with the CryptoLocker decryption service to maximize revenue. And this was in no doubt due to the success that the CryptoLocker had at extorting revenue. There is a guy named Michel Spagnulio, who's now a engineer at Google and Zurich, who published a thesis and a Bitcoin forensic framework. And he used this framework to analyze the Bitcoin addresses that were receiving the CryptoLocker ransoms. So the graph in the upper right shows the number of ransoms that were paid per day in gray, whereas the blue shows the total US dollar value of those payments. So out of curiosity, I looked at the price of Bitcoin during that time that CryptoLocker was running rampant, and that graph is shown in the bottom right. By the way, the vertical bars, that's when the CryptoLocker decryption service was introduced. And it, of course, charged a much higher ransom 
if you needed to use it after the time limit had expired for paying the original ransom. But modern ransomware does not just encrypt data, it exfiltrates it as well. The graph on the top right illustrates that, quote, the trust that stolen data will be deleted is eroding. Default payments are becoming more frequent when exfiltrated data is made public despite the victim paying. As a result, fewer companies are giving into cyber extortion when they are able to recover from backups. Now, the graphs on the bottom of the slide seem to indicate that ransomware is a problem that plagues only smaller companies. And that's a reasonable conclusion until you realize that those smaller companies are in the supply chains of most larger companies. As a result, ransomware continues to be a threat that is monitored even by the most sophisticated cybersecurity teams. Modern ransomware builds on the knowledge gained from the previous generations. Here's just one example. This is a gaming company out of Warsaw, Poland, and they basically said, yeah, we refuse to pay the ransom. This is one of my favorite quotes, this one from Eleanor Roosevelt. And I think about it every time that I hear about a major security incident. Spectre and Meltdown were two related hardware vulnerabilities that caused a major impact on the cloud, as well as personal computers, smartphones, and the like. And since it's hardware related, it's yet another vulnerability in the supply chain. The vulnerability occurred because of the need for modern CPUs to maintain the promise of Moore's Law and achieve ever hard to realize processing gains. So one way they were doing this was by proactively caching pre-executed code that was likely to be needed in the near future. It kind of reminds me of uh, Radar O'Reilly from that old TV series, MASH. And forgive the cultural reference, but in this old TV series, Radar O'Reilly would always anticipate what his boss, Colonel Potter, needed and have it ready right as it was being asked for. The problem is that the CPU did not implement strong protections on the cache so that one process could read the data that belonged to another process. This is not a big problem if all your processes are trustworthy, but that's not the case with multi-tenant computing. Meltdown was specific to Intel's CPU family, but Spectre, according to Google Project Zero, is a whole new class of vulnerabilities. And yes, there have been other Spectre type vulnerabilities that have been discovered since January of 2018. In most of our mental models, well, we trust our hardware, typically. And the problem though is that if you touch my data, you must properly protect it. But our adversaries are shifting left just like we are, right? So that's a common theme that you hear in the DevOps world is shift left. And our IT environments are so vast that we need tools to administer them. And we trust those tools. But what if this trust is misplaced? There was an article that was on the buildsecurityin.gov, which was a website created by the Department of Homeland Security, I believe it was. But anyway, they had this article called Reluctance to Trust. And the article said that, Trust should be closely held and never freely given. And they even went on to say is that it's important not to trust yourself too much as well. So do we really have defense in depth or just a chain of fragile dependencies? There was a popular book that was written several years ago. It was called Anti-Fragile. And the idea is that Anti-fragile is the opposite of being fragile. Uh, there's really not a word called anti-fragile, so the author, Nicholas Talib coined one. And he said that anti-fragility is stronger than resilience or robustness because the resilient entity resists shock and the anti-fragile entity gets better as a result of that. 
So how much of my security posture is invested in control X or system Y functioning the way that it always has? We always have said that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So I think that's an anti-fragile mentality. But this doesn't happen by accident. Excellence is the result of hard work and great attention to detail. Now at SANS, you've probably heard us say that the offense informs the defense. And from my conversations with your company, it looks like you are implementing uh, intelligence-driven defense and a variety of these other concepts. And those are definitely anti-fragile approaches. There is a anti-fragile software manifesto, and I, I like some of the themes that come out. One is um, building proactive and adaptive systems and welcoming these unexpected scenarios. Google calls them black swans, and they even have a black swan process where they set up an incident commander and they treat it as a security incident and drive it to resolution. But they know that when they have these black swan events that it really requires all hands on deck. Other ideas, uh, exposing your systems to faults and finding ways to implement automatic mitigations and being context aware of your environment, making sure that you have the systems in place to get that intelligence this, that intelligence that you need to be effective. I like this one. Continuous attention to technical excellence, reality, and redundancy, right? So often we can get so deep into our code, we're just um, head down, just coding away that we need to come up for air and also get a pulse of what's going on in the environment around us, right? And loving the idea of being anti-fragile and pausing at regular intervals to size up the context, the situation that you find yourself in. And then, of course, adjusting your behavior. So what is a hacker? I love Bruce Schneier's definition. He said, a hacker is somebody who thinks outside the box. It's someone who discards conventional wisdom and does something else instead. It's someone who looks at the edge and wonders what's beyond. It's someone who sees a set of rules and what happens if you don't follow them. A hacker is someone who experiments with the limitations of systems for intellectual curiosity. There's a guy named Timothy Summers who has part of his PhD research. He traveled around the world and interviewed top hackers and he used research techniques to garner some of these insights. But he said that identifying system weaknesses requires logical reasoning and the ability to think systematically through possible actions, alternatives, and potential consequences. This combination of reasoning and systemic thinking implies the use of mental models. Hacking is a cognitive activity that requires exceptional technical and reasoning abilities. Then he talked about two techniques, personal re reflection and social exploration. So in the personal reflection stage, this is all about generating the mental model and quote unquote, wrapping one's head around the problem. He called it sense making and creating these relationships between concepts, skills, people, experiences, mental logic, and so forth to begin making meaning. Whereas social exploration is where the hacker collaborates with his or her colleagues, interacting with other ideas, talking about the ideas and the concepts that they had created in the personal reflection phase and using this social discourse to make additional sense about the problem and then creating uh, predictive patterns to test their models and so forth. So he gathered anecdotal quotes from a variety of different hackers around the world. But this first one, right, this makes me think of the Matt Honan attack where they had chained together a variety of different techniques so as to social engineer and to get access to Matt Honan's various accounts. And then also just being able to size up the situation like Adam Gaudiak did of security explorations. And one of the points that I want to make 
during this talk is that everything is part of a supply chain. And this year, of course, we're highly sensitized to the supply chain because of things like the solar winds attack. We have B2B going on, serverless, service-oriented architectures, and so forth. Now, one of the ways that we can try and mitigate these attacks is by anticipating them using threat modeling. And threat modeling has value not only to the defense, but also to the offense, right? So a penetration tester may threat model a system before they attack it. And from what I understand, you all are using the attack framework, and that's awesome. Keep up the good work. The thing, though, that we find, especially as we move into the cloud, is that there's so many more trust boundaries because we have so many different vendors supplying so many different cloud services. And the thing that we need to remember is that the map is not the terrain. A map oversimplifies the terrain. And sometimes these mental models that we've developed oversimplify the problem or the system. So what are the assumptions that people are making? What can we fiddle with? And what can we lie to to see what will happen? Now, hacking is too important for it to be left simply to the security professional. So if you're a system developer or an architect, figure out how you can play with and and do this hacking process. And there's probably ways that you can do this within your organization. So for example, if you're writing your own code, try to break it on your own systems. But most organizations have a process to go about hammering and doing things like pen tests. So why should you embrace your inner hacker? Well, I did a paper, and the paper was for my master's program at SANS, and we had to write a paper on transformational leadership. So the paper that I wrote was called The Tyranny of the Urgent and the Transformational Security Leader. And as part of my research, I came across this Harvard Business Review article, and they said that we're driven by four human drives that influence both our behavior and our emotions. One is the drive to acquire. And this isn't just physical goods, but it's also social status. And we see this with a lot of hackers, right? Where they want to be seen by their peer group as having elite skills. We also have this desire to bond, to connect to that group and have that sense of belonging. We also need to make sense of the world. And I think Timothy Summers, that uh, professor that talked about the hacker mindset, he, he realized this, right? So that we, we have this need to do sense making, to make sense of the world. We also, and I found this one particularly interesting, have a desire, a drive to defend those people and those things that we care about. Now, when we satisfy this, that makes us feel secure that we're doing right by our loved ones and by the things we care about. The other thing is that research has shown that when we do this with others, it makes that, that shared experience feel more intense. So how can we embrace our inner hacker? Well, we should learn how software vulnerabilities are introduced. For example, what Adam Gaudiak did. We also need to spot and mitigate any nonconformity with best practices, right? Like the LinkedIn breach. I'm sure salting their passwords was on their backlog. They just didn't get to it. And then that was their downfall. We also need to think like an artist, not like a copycat. And here I want you to remember Duchamp's fountain, right? Provoke that unconventional thinking. Think out of the box. We also need to strategize multiple chess moves ahead. Think about the hacker involved in Matt Honan's hacking. We need to refine our mental models. Bit squatting, right? Remember, the map is not the territory. We also need to lie to our software and see what breaks, like we did with Heartbleed. We, we need to look for any of that legacy code that is being used in ways that is never intended by the original author, such as with Shellshock. 
We also need to learn from the successes and failures of our friends and our enemies, like with CryptoLocker. Also, don't blindly trust any opaque box, not even your CPU, as was well the lesson taught by Spectre Meltdown. And then we need to put guardrails on our automation and tooling. And that is just one of the many lessons that we learned from SolarWinds. So be sure you that you make time to hack. Learn how things really work. Don't just take those simplified models. Identify patterns and make predictions to test your hypotheses. Look for any misplaced trust wherever it would exist. Collaborate with your other colleagues as hackers would. Create proofs of concepts, not just to test your theory, but also to get that hands-on time that can be very rewarding and hack as a team. Stephen Covey, he created the time leadership quadrant and he said that there's, he, he basically said that there's urgent and not urgent activities. There's also important and not important activities. So he put these onto a quadrant. So what I've done is I went ahead and put some security stuff that we could overlay into each of these quadrants, right? So we know that responding to a security incident is both urgent and very important. However, in the security profession, we spend a lot of time fighting somebody else's fires and dealing with their self-inflicted wounds. And that doesn't necessarily add a lot of meaning to our personal life as security professionals which is why we need to also do hacking and find self-improvement activities such as, for example, taking a course. So I have a flow chart for you. You know, ruminate, come up with a model, discuss it and debate it with your friends and colleagues, refine it, and then play with it and attack it, tweak it, and then rinse, wash, and repeat. Now, Sands, we have a variety of courses. As John mentioned in the introduction, I teach sec 88 which is the Cloud Security Essentials class, and then I'm also now teaching SEC 510, which is Public Cloud Security for AWS Azure and Google Cloud Platform. And since this talk has been about hacking, I also wanted to mention our Defensive Operations curriculum. This curriculum was called the Penetration Testing Curriculum, but we quickly realized that Offensive operations is much more than just doing pen tests. So, for example, now we have red teaming and even purple teaming activities where the offense collaborates with the defense to improve their skills. And then, of course, exploit development. So some great stuff in the works and a lot of stuff has happened this last year. So science has definitely not been resting on their laurels during the COVID lockdown. Another great thing that has happened as a result of COVID was they made all of their summits virtual and free. So there's a summit that I want to invite you all to, which is CloudSec Next, which will be taking place June 3rd through 4th. And the other thing that's happening is many of these talks are now being recorded and put out on YouTube. So that's what I have for you. So I will stop right there and then open the floor to any comments, questions, or discussions.